good afternoon, good evening, everyone from different continents. Welcome to another cultural storytelling event where we share stories about history, travel, lifestyle, food, and more importantly, stories of inspiring people. The topic today, I believe everybody can relate to. It goes back to how we grew up, the toys we play, the very happy memories we associate with our childhood um, that become part of our identity, part of our history, a past we will always cherish. So today, I, it's my honor and a huge pleasure to introduce Jack, the great grandson of Pollock's museum founder, Margaret Forgery. So I am going to put Jack in the spotlight and I ask him to introduce himself a little bit. So Jack, very welcome. Uh, I love the background you have. Uh, it looks lovely. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you are and who you are? So hello everyone. Yeah, so I'm Jack. I'm yeah, the great grandson of uh, Pollock's Toy Museum's founder. Um, her name was Marguerite Fraudry and she started the museum in the, in the 50s. I'm sitting here in the entrance of the shop. So this is where you'd actually come in. And this is the front door actually. So I can see out onto the street. Um, but I'm sitting behind the desk because we're closed. So I can have this amazing backdrop behind me. And these are actually all the toy theatres that we sell and are part of the museum's collection. Uh, they're the kind of heart of the museum. And in my talk in a bit, I will uh, kind of show, give you a little history of the toy theatre in London. Um, yeah, so that's Great. where I am. Thank you very much, Jack. So before I give you the air, I'm gonna do a small polling. Uh, I am gonna ask everybody to put in, how old are you? You need to put two eggs. One is your mental age. The other is your actual age. So let's see who is still a child in our group. So yeah, I'm waiting for, got, I think a third of us have responded. We've waited. Let me wait for another 10 to, another one to two minutes for everybody to put in their answer. Okay, the answers that keep on coming. Uh, soon we will let Jack to present his talk. So now I'm gonna end the poll and share the result. Um, so among us today, <laughs> I believe more than half of us think we are still teenagers. Between the <laughs> age of 10 and 20, that's really the perfect age to come to Jack's talk. Uh, in terms of actual age, we are slightly older, but who cares about our actual age? So thank you very much for your contribution. Now, Jack, the floor is yours. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my uh, presentation with you and we'll go through quite quickly. And then at the end, um, you can ask me any questions or if you want to maybe write in a chat box or shout out if you've got any questions as we go along, um, I'm happy to try and answer them. But let me try and... Yeah, so do feel free to put in your questions in the chat box along the way. So can you all see this? Yes. Okay, so it's a 200 year history um, dating back to the 1820s, uh, which is quite incredible. Um, so this is where I'm sitting from right now uh, in the museum in the center of London in Fitzrovia. Um, we've been here for since the 1960s. Uh, we were in Covent Garden before that, but this is our current site. Um, in halfway through the tour, I'm gonna to take you actually around the museum with photographs. So we'll explore inside. Um, but before that, I'm going to go back to the kind of history of how we came about to be here. So we're called Pollock's Toy Museum, and, and that's because we're named after this man here called Benjamin Pollock. And he was a toy theatre maker, and he had a shop in Hoxton in East London, in the East End. Um, and that was his uh, sole business, was selling uh, paper and model theatres 
alongside plays and things. And you can see some of them in the window. He used to stick them on these windows. And um, so he was a printer and a publisher. Um, and he, he actually inherited the business from his father-in-law. And this is a, cop, a, a print of what his father-in-law's shop would have looked like. So the shops kind of carried on in this tradition of looking quite similar. Um, so his father-in-law was called Reddington. So he had a shop between 1840 and seven, 1870. Then Pollux took over and took over for quite a long time from the 1870s to the 1940s up until the Second World War. Then someone called Alan Keane took over. And then my great grandma took over in the 1950s and has been run by our family ever since. So it's been passed from different families, but for some kind of amazing reason, this unusual business has managed to kind of survive and um, kind of go through the ages, even though it's, you know, we've all got computers and much more kind of higher forms of entertainment in a way. This seems to have had an enduring kind of appeal or it's managed to survive by some sort of miracle. Um, so Mr. Pollock's shop in Hoxton, um, it was kind of the last remaining one um, of the, there was quite a few people making toy theatres in the 1800s, but he was the last person remaining. Um, we've got another lovely shot here of some little boys peering in the window, very excited to be buying their toy theatres. Um, so I'll just kind of run through what an actual toy theatre is, because for me growing up here, I've obviously take it for granted. Everyone thinks, I think everyone knows what a toy theatre is, but um, they, they are quite common throughout Europe, but in London particular had a big toy theatre trade. So in the 1800s. So this is a picture here of a, um, of a toy theatre. Um, so we'll go through kind of, these are some examples that we have in the museum um, and they are essentially just tiny versions of real theatres and you would be putting on plays and performing them at home. And they're incredibly beautiful and very well uh, detailed and kind of lovely to objects in their own right. Um, so this is kind of to give you the context of London. So London is a real theatre heartland of Britain and um, right in the center of London has a huge kind of cluster, even you know, to this day, even more so than ever of, of theaters. And um, this is a little map of central London. And this middle area here uh, still has quite a lot of, the kind of Covent Garden area has a huge, right by the, uh, near the river and right in the middle of central London, has a huge kind of um, number of uh, theaters all kind of packed, packed close together. Um, this is a closer look at just Co the Covent Garden area where um, this is from 1813. So this is kind of at the beginning of the of the theatre industry becoming big. Um, and yeah, it's uh, there's a kind of big cluster of them. And so from this real life theatre industry uh, kind of these are some images of the theatre. I mean, it really would have been the most kind of exciting thing going on. Uh, people would, it was just very, very, very popular. Um, no television, so everyone would flock to the theatre. Um, and these amazing, beautiful, huge theatres were built, you know, incredible. And sometimes they had amazing special effects on the stage. So, um, yeah, it was, it was the kind of 1800s Hollywood going on in central London. Um, so... This is just a picture of still to this day, one of the ones in um, central London, you know, still with this huge kind of shows you the grandeur that they were building in Victorian and 1800s uh, for these theatres, which are still standing. Um, this is an interior of one. This is still current. This is the Colosseum. Um, so this brings me to like the toy theatres as a trade. So their toy theatres grew up as a kind of and merchandise off the back of this big theater industry and little boys and girls were encouraged to kind of um, go to the theater and then when they left they would uh, want to uh, buy uh, the, their favorite actor almost like a poster of their favorite actor and these were called uh, theatrical portraits and they were made uh, yeah as merchandise and often they'd come black and white and you'd color them in at home or you'd buy them pre-colored and yeah these were the equivalent of um, yeah, fan, fan posters, basically. And then as this became very popular, 
someone someone well they all oh, this is they also used to do this thing called tinseling where they would cut out beautiful bits of uh, lovely foil and stick them on these characters and kind of adapt them and make them even more kind of beautiful um so children would sit for hours kind of carefully cutting them out and um making these pictures look kind of beautiful and things um but then someone decided oh we could make these characters a bit smaller and then we could all put them onto one sheet of paper to make it a bit cheaper to print. And then children could actually uh, carry, up, carry on playing when they got home the, and putting on performances. So it kind of evolved. And um, the children would kind of buy these, go and see this play, say Oliver Twist. And then they would buy this from the uh, toy theatre pr- publisher like Mr. Pollock and then go home and cut them out. And then they would be able to perform their own plays and they would get a little playbook. Um, and this was a really huge industry. It was kind of, there was quite a few different producers all around central London. They would also show you that they would sell the backgrounds as well. And then you would have these different characters to kind of come in on and off stage. Um, and there was a huge amount of kind of these things. So this is one actually made up and you can see that they create a lot of depth within them. Um, and it's a little playbook here with your script and things. So, Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a kind of example of what a very, very kind of well-off family this looks like. Um, and they're all gathering around to watch this performance in their, you know, very lovely London home, probably. Um, and so this is the kind of context. This is another example um maybe a bit less of an expensive home this one but you see everyone gathered around for this wonderful show and these toy theatre shows they can actually be very kind of evocative and wonderful even though the characters are just made of paper if you get the lighting correct it, they can be quite dramatic and quite um hilarious and emotional to watch so i can see the appeal we still do these shows to this day so um so this is just another example of a toy theatre. Um, this one's actually from uh, Europe. It's not an English one, but there was a kind of big scene in Europe as well. Um, so this brings me on to kind of how they were made. And um, Robert Louis Stevenson, who's the author of Treasure Island, uh, was a big fan of um, toy theatres. And he wrote a whole article about Penny Plain and Twopence Coloured, which meant that... Um, uh, the the theatre's prints were sold in black and white or coloured by the by the publisher and they were one penny for a black and white one and two pennies for a coloured one so it was up to the children to colour them in if they wanted or they could uh, if they didn't like colouring in they could buy a more expensive one that was already coloured now this is an example of how they're actually made these uh, toy theatres so this here on the left is a copper plate so this is a piece of metal that's had a drawing uh, etched into it using acid and then that's a drawing of the theatre and then when you push ink into this drawing you can then print these uh, theatres on the other side and all of the um, toy theatre things would have been printed in this way so this is something I'm very passionate about and I'm actually a printmaker as well so I print a lot of these and print new things and um, yeah, they're quite labor intensive. You can see here a close up. These are actually, you know, these are grooves into the metal which hold the ink and then you print them up like that. So um, they're very beautiful things. Uh, this is just an example of a chap here printing away. And then this is the printing press we have at the museum now so we can print the theaters. So it pushes the uh, metal under under the onto the paper at a very high pressure to then take the the indentation of the print. Um, this is an example of once you've printed your toy theatre, you would then colour it in. So you'd colour in with your box of paint and we still um, sell these today. This is one we've just made of an Alice theatre. So, um, so yeah, you colour in your proscenium front. So we sell this one black and white or you can buy it coloured already and it's a bit more expensive, but it's been done for you. So it's up to you if you're how artistic you want to be. Um, so this brings me back to Mr. Pollock. So Mr. Pollock was doing all this. He was selling toy theatres um, in central London and it was quite a big industry in the 1800s. And then it, as time changed, uh, it became a bit outdated. 
and new technologies came around, things like magic lantern slides and early cinema, and things like toy theatres became very unpopular. So his business kind of slowed down, slowed down a lot until it uh, got to the Second World War. And he, he actually sold the business just before the war started. And he moved out all of his stock, luckily, because a few weeks later, a uh, German V2 rocket actually landed on the, the top of the building. And you can see on this picture here on the right, it the bombed out shop. And this is quite a common image for Hoxton. Hoxton was hit very badly. The East End of London was hit very badly in the Second World War. Um, and this building now got is now just got uh, pulled down and made into modern flats. So, um, yeah, his shop is no more. But that's where um, our history kind of comes in. So after he died, uh, his daughters took it on until the war. And then um, a man called Alan Keane uh, rescued it. But then he couldn't make it make any money. And in the early um, 50s, he went out of business. And the story goes with my great grandma is that she was looking for just a tiny piece of a theatre, a bit of a, a character on a stick. And she um, she asked, she rang up the Mr. Pollock shop and she got through to the people that were dealing with the bankruptcy. And they said, you can't buy anything. You, can, you can't buy one little thing. You could buy the whole stock, though. You could buy everything. And so she scratched her head and thought, maybe I could try and rescue this business. And she did. She managed to borrow some money and bought all of Mr. Pollock's stock, which dates back to the 1830s. So it was quite a bold move um, for her to do that in the 50s. So this brings me to what she created as Pollock's Toy Museum. So this is in the this is a picture taken actually in the uh, in the 70s uh, in our current site. So my great grandma realized that the toy theater business wasn't strong enough or big enough to be able to support itself. Um, so she needed to turn it into a museum as well. So rather interestingly, most museums have a museum and then they have a shop attached to it. Whereas our museum started as a shop and then had a museum attached to it. <laughs> so the museum was to promote people to come to the shop and to kind of um, create a atmosphere around the toy theatres. So this is in the early days in the 70s. Um, and you can see this 70s and then 2020, this picture was taken. You can see how big the tree has got. <laughs> um, but not much else has changed. We've done a bit of painting and things, but uh, it's more or less pretty similar. Um, actually, now the tree was actually cut down last year because it would become rotten. So now there is no tree, but we're going to get a new one planted. But this is a picture of I just took yesterday of the outside of the museum and you can see our beautiful mural and um, this is the other side where our, our, uh, this is a kind of we kind of made it look like Mr Pollock's old shop uh, so we've got the theatrical portraits stuck in the window and things um, and I'm sitting in here right now that's where I am. Um, now our buildings are quite interesting because they're actually one was built in 1750 the, the one on the left with the mural on it and then the one next to it was built in 1850. So um, the one on the left is much older, 100 years older than the other one. Uh, but they're both kind of amazing uh, examples. One of Georgian architecture in London and one of uh, Victorian architecture in London. Um, and my great grandma knocked through. So the museum actually is in both of these buildings and there's um, a, a passageways between both, which is quite amazing. So. Um, I'm going to take you on a just a quick tour of the museum and we'll we'll go around um, as if you were a visitor. Um, so um, so this is where you come in and this is where I'm sitting at the moment. So you come into the front desk like this and you're um, you're confronted with a whole wall of toy theatres. So as they're the core of the museum. We like to welcome people with all our toy theatres. Uh, we have some for sale, uh, a lot of new ones or, or reproductions of old ones, and then a mix of some of the nice older ones. Um, if you turn to your left, there's this uh, more toy theatres and then this bust here. So this is the bust of my great grandma. And so she sits above us, welcoming people into the museum and kind of keeping an eye on all of us. So we're behaving ourselves um, as the founder. She's kind of looking over us constantly. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then you turn and you start 
going through this door here and you start, you enter the museum. So this is actually three images spliced together here. So it's a bit confusing, but the image on your left is um, the American toys we have. So we've got these cast iron American money banks. And then we have some other examples of American toys um, down at the bottom. And then in the middle here is actually uh, one of my favorite things in the museum, which is right at the beginning, but these are from Ecuador and they're actually made of bread. Um, it's a nativity scene of baked bread um, but the bread is baked so much that it goes tough and then they glaze it and it just becomes kind of, it will last forever. Um, and they're very beautiful. You can see they're very well um, colored and very de delicate and detailed, but they're just made of um, bread. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite things to start with. And um, then you go, we go up the stairs. And so when we come to room one. So room one in the museum um, has a big rocking horse in it and lots of trains um, and in the corner it's also got lots of uh, board games and um, mainly what children would have been playing with in Victorian times so there's examples of magic lanterns um, which are kind of early cinematography devices um, this is some more examples of them so they're kind of um, beautiful scenes that you would put a projector behind and then you would say stories of it. Um, I'm going to go whistling through all these toys because there's so much in the museum and we don't have much time. So um, this is a case we have, which is full of toys from the seventies and sixties. So about space travel and when that was very exciting. So toys often reflect the politics or the current thing happening at the moment. And they tend to mimic what's happening in the adults lives. Um, so they are often a very kind of interesting social commentary about the society at the time. Um, so we exit this room by going up these stairs here. And the, in lots of ways, the architecture of the museum is just as important uh, for me anyway, as the, as the objects that are in there. I think the buildings are very um, unmodernized and kind of as they were. So they're quite an experience to come around. So you feel that you're kind of um, stepping back in time. So the room above, uh, apologies, this is a bit blurry, this image, but the room above has lots of tin toys in it. And these are mainly made in Britain um, because in the after the war, there was a big trade embargo with Germany. Germany were the very big toy manufacturers. Uh, but then after the war, uh, British people stopped wanting to buy German toys. So then the British had to learn how to make their own toys. So a lot of these things are made in England. Um, uh, yeah. Then we have a, a little section for Indian toys. So my great grandma, she did like to travel the world and kind of collect toys from other cultures. So we do have quite a wide range of toys from around the world, mainly collected when she was traveling around in the 70s and 80s. So um, yeah, they might be kind of examples of toys at that time, uh, but beautiful, lovely kind of hand painted and colorful Indian toys and made of, um, kind of wooden uh, mechanisms and things. Um, and then on the right here, we have got Punch and Judy. So we have a kind of big tradition of Punch and Judy in Britain, uh, which uh, is quite a strange uh, puppet show uh, that happens on beaches and things. It's seen as quite an English thing, but actually it originates in Italy. And um, it, it also is, a, there's a version in France as well. So in a very kind of classic way, uh, us, British people like to be very proud of our kind of British heritage. But then if you dig a little deeper, it actually turns out it's all come from Europe. So, but don't tell that to the... Um, I really thought did you, um, Punch and Judy are from France because like in French movies, they, they yeah. do... Okay. Yeah, no, they, well, they came from Italy first and then to France mm. and then to um, then to, the, to England, yeah. So um, then in the next room, we have Eric. So Eric's one of our oldest toys in the museum and he's uh, one of the oldest teddy bears in the world. He was born in 1905. So um, the, what does that make him? Uh, over, uh, over 115 years old or something. So he's a um, very old teddy bear. Um, you come then down the stairs and this is one of my favorite sections in the museum. This is the folk toys from Eastern Europe. Um, this is an area that my great grandma loved to travel to. And 
I find them very beautiful uh, toys and all handmade uh, by small kind of communities or villages in Eastern Europe, uh, passing on kind of a tradition. Um, and these are some of my favorites, actually. They're, they're paper cutouts of uh, birds uh, made in um, Eastern Europe, I think either Poland or um, Russia. But um, yeah, they're kind of lovely. So then down the stairs, we come to the doll's room. So this is a room that we have, which is seen as the nursery. Some people find this room quite creepy um, because we have like hundreds of little eyes all peering out at us. Um, but yeah, it kind of, it's meant to mimic a, a, a kind of late Victorian nursery scene. So we have the kind of fireplace and all kind of as it was back then. Um, we have down here actually quite an interesting thing that was donated a few years ago, but this is a, a wax doll from China actually. And she's, um, she's a kind of, um, she's maybe kind of 18th century, 1800s uh, traditional Chinese uh, kind of grandma. And she's got lots of uh, lovely kind of wonderful clothes in this box. And the box that she's in is actually an old uh, tea exporting box. So, it would have come filled with tea and it's a very beautiful box and someone's put the doll in there. So um, this is the other view of the dolls room. So you can see really filled with even more and more dolls. Um, yeah. So in this room, we have these pearly kings and queens. So these are very um, quintessential English uh, London tradition. So my great grandma was very keen to kind of support and promote like London traditions. And she got these dolls dressed up and made as pearly kings and queens. What they are is they're, they're um, from the traditional working class Cockney communities in the East End of London and in South London and a bit in North London. Um, these uh, uh, traditional working people would, uh, they were kind of, almost not anti the royalty, but they decided to make themselves their own royalty. And they started to sew buttons onto jackets, uh, beautiful pearl buttons, and they made themselves these uniforms and they uh, declared themselves kings and queens of certain areas. Uh, but instead of kind of ruling, they would actually spend their time um, going around and collecting money for charity to support their local communities or to support projects. So they would dress up in these beautiful outfits and then they would go and ask people for money. Um, and this is tradition's been going on for over a hundred years, but it's uh, still very active today. And they're wonderful people to kind of interact with. Uh, they've got very, very strong kind of London Cockney accents often, and they um, yeah, still go out and collect money for them. So they're called Pearly Kings and Queens, and they're really uh, a kind of phenomenon of London, um, but very beautiful. There's also a theme running through the museum, which is a kind of craft. So a lot of the things like the toy theatres and the pearlies, you know, there's an element of um, making and craft and folk culture kind of. Um, yeah, so that's a kind of thread that runs through the museum. This is a baby that lives in a cabbage. She's a uh, wind up and she kind of pops up and down. So she <laughs> she moves. She's an automa automatate, automa uh, automata. That's how you say it. Um, so now we leave that room and we come down the staircase here. And the last room in the museum is full of the toy theatres because they're our heart and our namesake and make us quite unique. So we've got more toy theatres in here. Um, examples from around. Uh, there's actually a few examples from France, from Denmark and um, other European countries that were um, big in making toy theatres. It's quite interesting because you can see an aesthetic difference between uh, the different European countries. Like the French one is very romantic and elegant and quite well kind of drawn, whereas the English ones are a bit more kind of um, kind of rougher, but a bit more kind of bright and gaudy and kind of um, in your face a bit. So there's these kind of cliches of the differences between these different European countries kind of shows through on the toy theatres. Um, then you come down, this is the final staircase. And my great grandma, she was very keen on uh, understanding Chinese culture and a um, bit of Japanese, but she was particularly keen on uh, an interest in Chinese culture. I think she was very uh, left wing and I think she was quite intrigued by um, the communists um, in China. So 
we have here a box here with Mao Zedong's red book and some toys that uh, revolutionary children might have played with. Um, and yes, yeah, she was kind of very interested and she kind of obviously, I think she was keen for my dad and my uh, uncle to learn Chinese. She said it was going to be the future. So she was obviously very, um, had a big forethought when she was creating the museum, but also knew that uh, China would become more prominent in the world. So, um, and then this is one of my favorite cases. This is actually Japanese, um, but it's a very beautiful case. So one of the things with Pollock's Toy Museum is that the, the cases themselves are almost as interesting as the things inside them often. So they're very beautifully kind of decorated and made. And I think there's more about the aesthetic than the actual, maybe the, the uh, context of them. It's more a kind of artistic approach to a museum curation, but. Uh, I think they look quite happy in this little case. <laughs> <laughs> and then you finish here in the gift shop, like all good museums, you get forced to try and buy stuff on your way out. So this is all for toys. Um, and yeah, so that's the, that's the end of the my talk. So yeah, there's more information on our website if anyone's interested, or if, obviously if you come and visit, you can... Um, look see there if you're in London and you can um, check that we're open or come and contact us um, so yeah I will unstop there and then I thank you so, so much Jack it's uh, it's wonderful to hear your family history the history of London's toy museum and also last but not the least uh, we kind of experience different cultures through toys uh, I put Jack's email in the chat box, info.pollockstorymuseum at gmail.com in case if you want to contact him. There are a couple of questions coming up. So I think Mark, do you want to ask questions directly to Jack? So I'm going to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Jack. Um, a couple of questions. One is, do you uh, did Mr. Pollock have a Glasgow connection? Because there's a very distinct area of Glasgow called Pollock. And strangely enough, it had a toy museum in Hags Castle in Pollock. It's not there anymore, but it used to be there. So do you have a, a, um, a, a Scottish connection? Well, that's quite interesting. Uh, I, Mr. Pollock definitely didn't have a Scottish connection. I think he was um, from, I think his descendants was from Polish immigrants. And he was um, in the East End, he was Jewish Polish. So. Pollock being like that but funnily enough I do have a Scottish connection because on my other side of my family they're all from Scotland and I do go up quite a lot um, and there's big uh, trucks that go around which are called Pollock I think they're a you know they're a logistics or moving company so it's obviously also a big Scottish a Scot that has a Scottish connection but not with our Pollock no um, but I'll look up that uh, that Glasgow Toy Museum sounds quite interesting well, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. They closed it down. Uh, they closed Cags Castle down and right. made it into a um, and made it into a house. Uh, right. But uh, right. the there is a toy museum in Edinburgh, uh, which yep. is quite well known. Yep. I have been there. And then Robert Louis Stevenson, he was in Edinburgh, and he 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 made put uh, Mr. Pollock on the map by being a big fan of his. So there was a connection there, and he used to buy them uh, on the Leaf Walk. There was a stationer's there that would sell them to him. So, yeah. Um, so I also saw a couple of questions from a uh, couple, uh, Andrea and Lillian, who has, like, they both have got a uh, French and Chinese backgrounds. Uh, so your, your last session definitely speak to them as well. So shall I unmute Lillian and Andrea for your sharings or questions, comments? Uh, yeah, it, was that my question about the, the prince, is it? Yeah. Do you want yeah. to ask directly to Jack? Yeah, I, I, I was. Uh, my, my question was uh, concerning the prints, the um, all the copper prints that were in black and white and then painted by hand. Uh, my question was, why is it that they didn't find a way to print colors as well on top of it? And I was thinking, referring, somebody answered that it's a completely different technique, but I was referring to the Japanese woodblock prints. So you yeah. could imagine some 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 several uh, ways of uh, doing it more industrialized or something. 
I'm yeah. I'm curious to know if, why they didn't do it. Well, I mean, so the Japanese, for the example of Japanese woodblock prints, I mean, they were very labor intensive, actually. You know, they would have three, they would have a master for the cutting, they would have a master for the coloring, and they would have a master for the printing. So they were quite labor intensive. I think when they were made, even then, they would have been very expensive. So for Mr. Pollock, uh, his problem was trying to get them cheap. You know, people wanted them as cheap as possible. So yeah, the technique of etching doesn't lend itself very well to color printing. You can um, add a bit of color in some ways, but it's very labor intensive. So um, it was not until lithography, uh, stone lith lithography, which took over from etching, that they could start making things a bit quicker in their print production and with color. But the way that they would do their coloring, Mr. Pollock, he would get uh, his family to help. And they had all these different stencils uh, for all the different shapes. And they would just very quickly put the stencil on and whack one color over the top and then take them and whack the next one and stack them all up to dry and then do the next colors. So a lot of the coloring is quite crude, um, but that's also kind of part of its charm. Um, but yeah, printing color was quite a tricky, tricky thing to do. So that means it was industrialized. So it was not just like coming with a, with a little brush and, uh, and painting like a kid would do. Yeah, they were they they were it, they were painting still with their brushes, but it was kind of you know they were it was um, I think the Victorians were much more used to that kind of you know manual you know labor in that sense. There was and they, and they do it. He got his children to do it and things you know in the in their in their. I, I guess Jack, they had to keep them affordable anyway, didn't they? If they if they'd been very professional, they would have been out of reach of a lot of people's pockets. They had to make them as cheap as possible. Yeah, they actually made them. The quote I told you, a penny paint and two pence yeah. coloured. Actually, they actually managed to reduce that. So it became half a penny plain and a mm -hmm. penny coloured. They managed to get the quality lower down. So, um, And children quite... would like to colour them in anyway, wouldn't Kids would love to colour them. Well, adults nowadays would colour them in, wouldn't they? It's become a big thing for Yeah. Adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're wonderful things to do because you get to, uh, yeah, get to color them in, but then you get to make them. You have to kind of fold things and mm. uh, maybe some, cut wood down and make your stage, and then, you know, then you get to perform. So you, you'd hope that a child would like one of those stages of the thing. And I'm sure them. I'd like one now when I'm well past being a child. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's the question, Jack. How do we get one now? How do we get? Uh, what, well, yeah, we, we, we sell them on our online shop and then we also, um, I mean, the thing, I have a bit of a problem, the same as Mr. Pollock, is that to make them cheap enough for people to want to buy or to, to afford, I have to get them printed by a machine now, you know, so they kind of lose a bit of their, they're still beautiful, but they lose their charm. So but I do print them downstairs on the printing press, but uh, the labor costs just become a bit expensive for most people. So we do a kind of bespoke service for real fans. We... Uh, print them off the original blocks and I can hand color them for people. But in general, we sell them um, printed digitally now. Uh, yeah, so. So, and I'm gonna have a rush of orders, Jack, after this, after this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and has a question in London. Um, hi, yeah, um, I think it's sort of half been answered. I was just thinking of, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, with about 1800, there was a sort of sweated labor for needlework patterns in Germany, Berlin wool work, because they could only produce squared patterns in black and white. And for about at least, I don't know exactly, probably about 20, 30 years, there were thousands of young women in Germany just literally hand painted these squares, which must have sent them cross eyed. I've actually got some at home. And then suddenly they learned how to color print and they just all completely lost their jobs so I, I was just wondering but you answered the question you say it was done with stencils so yeah well uh, I mean it was cheap labor it was sweaters home home work you know that they did it yeah well we've got we're kind of interesting now in Britain at least that uh, materials have become Become much more expensive, um, but labor uh, have become much cheaper. But labor has become incredibly expensive. Whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. in Victorian 
in Victorian yeah. London, it would have been the other way around. So the materials would have been very, very expensive, but the labour was incredibly cheap. So yeah. it kind of like this. So. Yeah, well, that's why I was wondering whether there was anything similar for the Toy Museum at that time, whether people, you know, whether they outsourced the, the painting to people. I mean, you're saying they did it themselves with stencils, but I wonder if, because cheap labour was so cheap. Yeah, no, he. I think even cheaper was to get your daughters to do it. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a family with a business. I know what that's like. <laughs> I have to say, I bought many of your toy museums over the years. Um, used to buy them from my local museum to look closed and gave them to loads of kids in the family. They're absolutely fantastic to play with all these, all these things. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cammy uh, from Alabama, can I unmute you? In in case you've got questions, I saw some questions from chat box from you. Oh, okay. I, I think they might have already been answered. Let me scroll back up. Although I did ask my dad if we could find some of the bread dough ones when we're in Ecuador this summer. <laughs> well, your dad is here, so I know he can put that in here. <laughs> and I think Rami and ask the question. Do you have music box in the toy museum? Yes, yeah, so we have a, uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but it's, it's, it's got this huge, uh, it's a really big one. It's got a big disc inside of it and it's, uh, you wind it up and it can, it plays uh, the tune that's on there. So it's just like a gigantic version of a smaller music box. Yeah, it's very wonderful. If, yeah, you're if you come making... and visit, I'll uh, wind it up and just play it, play it for you. If anyone comes and visits, you can ask for it to be played. <laughs> <laughs> That's very much like a VIP service we are getting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Albert, uh, Albert asked the question. Albert, I don't know what if I can unmute you so you can ask the question to Jack directly, or should I ask on behalf of you? Is this about the Indonesian shadow puppets? So Albert has got two questions. One is Indonesian shadow puppet, and the other was, were the toy theater books the same script as the actual play? Uh, so the, the scripts were, no, they were slightly abridged. I think initially they were incredibly long and a bit boring. Uh, some of them were very, very long. And then they would get shorter and sh they got slightly more abridged as the, um, yeah, more kind of tailored for the child's um, attention span or kind of timing. So, um, yeah, they were kind of specific for the toy theatre. Uh, but there is one, I think it's called the Battle of Waterloo, and it's like uh, 40 hours long or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. <laughs> got hundreds of characters or something, and it's a, yeah, it's a marathon. It sounds uh, perfect for our lockdown life last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. Jack, I've got a couple of questions for you, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, this is fascinating talk and uh, thanks for also being the first museum owner uh, for our culture storytelling event. My question is really, um, as the fourth generation who inherited this museum, it, it, it's definitely really unique, but I can imagine it's also quite challenging to manage it and try to preserve a history, especially last year. I know you did a very successful crowdfunding campaign last year trying to save the museum. Can you tell us a little bit more about the campaign and why you are so passionate about preserving when maybe it would be easier for you to sell to another family? Yeah. Um, well, first thing, I'm not actually the owner yet. My dad's still the owner. So, <laughs> uh, but I am. Um, yeah, I'm very much involved and 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 uh, help out as much as possible. And actually, in the last few months, I've taken on a lot more responsibility, and he's taken a more of a back seat. So, um, so yeah, I do have a lot of the responsibility, and I do feel it. It's a big. Uh, it, I love it, and it's very special. But it also is a big responsibility. Um, why am I so passionate about it? Well, I think that it, well, A, it's just, I'm very, very into material, you know, I'm very interested, interested in the past, but also interested in objects. And I think that they are very, 
um, important things to preserve, especially if they're as beautiful as some of the things we have here. Um, I think that the museum kind of offers, all museums do this, but our museums particularly offers a kind of uh, imagination, it inspires people, is people's imagination and is quite a creative space, as well as being academic if you want to look at the toys in that sense. So um, I think it does offer quite a unique um, experience. I from what I gathered, museums used to be, in, in Britain anyway, they used to be much more stuffed full of things and a bit more like a kind of someone's, you know, a collection has been squeezed in, but they've slowly become more and more um, thinned out in a way and, and more highlighted certain objects or they've been given lots of money from um, and they've snazzed up their buildings and, and there's lots of interactive things with screens and stuff and and although that's probably quite good and lots of museums have maybe become more accessible in some ways i think that they've some have lost their um that that charm of being quite cluttered or um in old buildings so i think we we offer a nice um you know uh we complement a lot of the other museums now so i think that's why this one's particularly important to me and i'm passionate about it um I'm also quite lucky because I am an artist as well and a printmaker. So I do just deeply love the, the history of Mr. Pollock's and the toy theatre. And um, I suppose it's just, uh, my great grandma said that we, she was too mad to let it die. So I suppose there's a bit of that, that it feels like we've come this far to kind of like, even though it's obviously a bit strange and there's other things and bigger things in the world, but this is just, yeah. Uh, we're kind of here and we have to kind of maintain it even though sometimes it doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> um, uh, we love but... madness. We... Yeah. It, it's almost like you were, in a way, your great-grandma saved this museum uh, from another family and you are trying to do things with a similar spirit. Our question yeah. from Lillian is, uh, what's the top sell? in the shop are you replenishing the museum with new toys now oh this is a very interesting question something that i'm interested in so we so the toy theaters are our main things that we sell and we've just made a new one with alice in wonderland and uh because i rather um savvily found out that the original illustrations are actually totally out of copyright so i just used all the original illustrations and uh I got a friend to make a new script because that is in copyright. So we've made a toy theatre um, of Alice in Wonderland, which is very popular. Um, but the shop is quite an interesting one because what I really want to do is to make it more. I want it to be actually filled with less plastic toys and mm -hmm. less things that are, you know, shipped from all over the world. I'd like to make it more local and maybe more handmade. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking into this, but it's quite tricky. Again, we're back to what we were saying about, you know, labor and people making things. And it's something that I think is really important. And I want to encourage more making. I'd maybe like to stock things in the shop that, you know, people then, you like the toy theaters, they then build themselves or make themselves. So it could be kits of making a dolly or kits to make a teddy bear and things. So this is what I'm moving towards to make it more, I suppose, more environmentally friendly, but also more um in line with the museum to kind of harbor creativity uh but then it's tricky because also it's a shop so it's meant to make money so you can't uh, <laughs> sometimes be, yeah it, i i'm just learning all this but i would like yeah so if anyone's got any suggestions of nice uh people that sell lovely toys uh please tell me <laughs> great again i'm putting uh jack's email address here for people to get in touch with him if you want to um, know more about his projects? A couple more questions, more questions about toys, really. Uh, yeah. first question is, did any toy theaters combine with Magic Lantern shows? And that's an interesting question. I don't actually know the answer to that, but it would be quite special to see. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I know that the Magic Lanterns kind of, yeah, kind of muscled the toy theaters out of the way, but I don't know if you could combine them. That's interesting, maybe. It would be good to see. I'm actually planning an exhibition uh, for next for this autumn with an um, artist who make Magic Lantern shows. Um, so I'll uh, keep you guys posted about that and send you any information about that. But yeah, do let us know. Uh, yeah. Tracy got another question. Uh, Tracy, do you want to ask? 
the question directly. Also, share your teddy bear because I, I I think you have two teddy bears to share with us. My <laughs> question, Jack, was whether or not for the museum parts rather than for the toy theatres, do you ever need donations of vintage toys, or have you got more than you need? <laughs> Well, we do take donations still, but we're so full of, we've got such a limited space. So we tend to ask people to send pictures. And then if they're yeah. particularly something that we don't have one of, or if it's particularly interesting, then we'll say yes. But um, we tend to be, I mean, it's a tricky one because I personally do like to receive the donations, mainly because it's quite nice for the people giving them because they, toys are very sentimental, aren't they, and special. And often they're maybe not very valuable, but they have this huge sentimental um, um, attachment. So giving them to the museum is a nice way for them to live on. So I often like to try and do that for people, but we have uh, run out of space. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is because I, as an only child, all my toys were in immaculate condition. And um, I offered some that were quite rare to, to a, a museum once. And they just said, no, we don't even want to see them. And oh. I thought, Oh, okay. And since then, I've discovered that they did me a favour because they, they will probably be quite valuable. And I just thought, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, boo, you know. But, um, yeah, for yeah. that glorious. I, I thought we had to bring our toys. So I have brought Big Ted. Lovely. He used yeah. to growl when you tipped him on his back, but he's lost his voice. He, he I've had since I was one. And this is Pink Ted. <laughs> as you see don't laugh at him Minji he's not pink anymore oh I've had since I was born so he's a year older than Big Ted lovely um, it's nice to see that you're playing with teddy bears as well because yeah. there's this history, there's history the teddy bears apparently were kind of encouraged to yeah. promote um caring for boys so young girls were given the dolls and then teddy bears were meant to make boys a bit more kind of caring well, and loving. I never was I have, I did have dolls, but I think a teddy, I certainly have much more affection for my teddies than for any doll I ever had. Yeah. So I've been and got them out of the loft just to, just to show to everyone this afternoon. Lovely, <laughs> I'm sure they're happy to, happy to be out. <laughs> the dog was a bit disconcerted when he saw them coming down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. It's their first time to be on Zoom. It is actually, Minji. It's the first time they've encountered a computer, I think. Mm, that's a great first step for <laughs> modernization. So I, I know we, uh, we have this activity to share our toys. So if anybody wants to uh, share as Tracy just did, feel free to unmute yourself and share a little bit of piece of your childhood. <laughs> People are too shy. Oh, <laughs> Gary, <laughs> I'm going to put you in spotlight. <laughs> so, do you have? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, yes. Hi. <laughs> What would you like? I, I, I just, Minji, I was looking around. I don't really have anything because I wasn't prepared well. Uh, and you, you sent out the notice and I didn't, um, I didn't comply. I have some, some things that I found very recently because I'm clear, clearing out a storage location, a uh, catcher's mitt that was my father's. And it is approximately 100 years old because my father had it when he was eight or nine and I'm 80. <laughs> so therefore, it's 100 years old. And I, and I have a few other items. I should have, should have had them with me. Mm -hmm. I don't. It's OK. Next time we travel to Britain, when you visit Pollock's Museum, make sure you pack one or two of them just to let your toys meet the toys of Jack. <laughs> so um, thank you so much, Jack. For, oh, Mark, you've got something to show. Your spinning top. So I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. I'm um, a poet and uh, one of the things that I do is I write poetry in shapes. And one of the poems that I wanted was a spinning top. 
So I wanted a, a spinning top that I could put in front of the audience when I was reading the poem, so that they got the sense of the poem coming out the, the spinning top. <laughs> oh, I hope one day you can read that poem with your spinning top, uh, put these two uh, together alongside each other. Thank you very much. Oh, Helen, you are ready. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Can you see me? Sorry. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've um, got a little collection of musical um, pins. That, and two of them I bought in uh, France from flea markets. And uh, this one's really old, I think. it's. Uh, I just love all the, the paintings around them. And when you turn them... I think I bought them all in France, actually. Um, so this one's got little teddy bears around it. That's really nice. <laughs> this, one's the, this one's the most new, which is... <laughs> and then this one. This has got a circus theme. I just love them. <laughs> Hello, it looks like your childhood never ends. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jack and everybody for really brilliant, brilliant talk, Jack. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. That's good. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but there's so many different avenues we could go shooting off on with the museum. But um, yeah, if anyone uh, wants to come and visit as well, I'm happy to show you around in person. So that was great. This is fantastic. Jack also does a lot of virtual talks. Uh, you're also giving a lot of educational talks to schools in London. Hopefully with your, um, with the avenue of doing things online, you can spread your passion to the wider community. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, uh, last announcement is about our talk coming on Sunday. Um, most of us know Sayuri, who is so bubbly and passionate uh, from Brazil. We talked about uh, what we can show about uh, an experience and an online virtual tour about Brazil. It's such a huge country with such a diverse culture and demographic. It's really, really, uh, it's really hard to find an angle, but um, I want to ask, uh, how many of you have heard of a movie, have watched the movie City of God a few years back? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, City of God um, probably is the most famous movie about Brazil uh, coming out to international stage. However, while talking with Sayuli, she said this only represents part of Brazilian culture but it doesn't say all. So next week, we have got the pleasure to invite Sayuli and uh, Tatia, a colleague of her. Both of them are situated in Brazil. They have done some works with local uh, slums, um, which are basis of the movie, um, City of God. But what they what really want to show us is Brazil more than City of God. So I will send out an email soon. We will see each other next week. Uh, another applaud for Jack who brought us back to our childhood. So see you next week for Brazil. See you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving, but I just stopped by. So happy Mother's Day to everyone. And I hope I'll see you. I will be live from the favela. So I hope you enjoy it. So I hope, Sayuli, I did some justice promoting your talk because you're just so passionate about Brazil. I, I always thought it's much better for the introduction of next week coming from you. I'm so glad you can show up. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I will be live from the favela. Some of you know already. I do some cooking experience there. And uh, the idea is to show that favelas, uh, they do have problems of drugs, just like City of God, but they are mainly working class neighborhood. So there are lot, lots of artists there, you know, full of history. And I hope to show you a little bit of local life in the favelas um, that has lots of problems, 
but also we can share lots of love there. So I hope I see you there next week. Great. So I'm going to finally play a trailer by Jack. Jack, the trailer you did for your crowdfunding campaign. Is that OK? I just thought it's beautifully done. So. Yeah. It's finished now, but uh, you so, can still show it. Let me see this one. Hello, my name's Jack, and I'm the great grandson of Pollock's Toy Museum's founder, Marguerite Fordry. I'm making this video to you today to reach out to you to ask for help in securing the future of the museum. We have been badly affected by the pandemic, seeing our visitors numbers drop dramatically over the past year. We rely entirely on these visitors for tickets and sales in our small shop and so have been left struggling to pay the bills. We are asking for your help for financial aid in this time. We think that the museum is a rare treasure that should be kept for future generations to enjoy and find inspiration. The museum first opened in the 50s in Covent Garden then moved to our current premises in Fitzrovia in the 60s. But our history go back, goes, goes back further than that. We are named after Benjamin Pollock, the last of the toy theatre publishers. My great-grandma rescued the business from bankruptcy and took on his stock. So our lineage dates back to the 1800s. The museum is filled with uniquely colourful cases that sing out to you from the past. For any of you who have visited, you will know that there are not many museums as unique as ours. Highlights on display are Eric, one of the world's oldest teddy bears, coming in at over a hundred years old. Accompanying the toys on display are the buildings themselves, built in 1750 and 1850. They are unmodernised and able to transport visitors back in time, a rare experience when many museums have lost their character. Over the years, Pollux has played a vital role in inspiring people with its collection. From early visits from Robert Louis Stevenson to more recently the likes of Angelina Jolie. Actors and theatre directors often cite their toy theatres as what started them on their careers. We are working with the Pollock's Toy Museum Trust to plan for the future, and we're reaching out to our existing supporters and those who have yet to discover our collection to help us survive for the future. We think museums play a vital role in society. Especially in troubling times, there can be places for relaxation and reflection, and we think that the Toy Museum is a perfect place for that. Our biggest concern is keeping the museum open at the moment. We are asking for contributions to our crowdfunder, which can be found at www.crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash Save Pollock's Toy Museum. We have some lovely giveaways to say thank you for your donations, so please do check out the page. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Your support is essential and greatly appreciated, and we look forward to welcoming you back soon. Jack, that's just so beautiful. Everybody, see you next week.